Welcome back to part four of Civitai.com's official beginner's guide to AI art. In this video of the series, we are going to dive in and get familiar with the user interface of Easy Diffusion and Automatic 1111, as well as generate our very first but basic AI image. In the following videos, we will be diving into much more detail as far as crafting prompts and really pulling the best imagery that we can. But for now, we are focusing on just getting comfortable moving through the software because these things can be quite overwhelming if you are brand new to it all. So without any further ado, let's hop into the computer. I'll see you there. All right, so we are going to kick this off by walking through the user interface of Easy Diffusion first to keep things simple and timely. We are only going to be walking through the interface on the Windows version of Easy Diffusion, but please keep in mind that everything should be exactly identical on the Mac OS version. The only thing that will be a little different is how you launch it. But if you need the reminder of how to launch Easy Diffusion on Mac OS, you can jump back over to the installation video. And towards the end of that, um, I go over how to launch Easy Diffusion each time after the initial installation. So if you need a refresher or a reminder on that, you can jump back to video number two. But let's go ahead and launch Easy Diffusion. So we're going to find our Easy Diffusion directory. Mine is installed in my C drive. And then we're going to launch the start stable diffusion UI dot CMD. That is going to launch a oh, open. That is going to launch a command window. And just so I can always keep an eye on how things are set up and to make it really easy. This is personally how I like to set my windows up. So I always keep the command prompt open here on the right. I keep a file directory window on the right as well. And then I kind of keep the rest of the screen open for the user interface. That way, um, if I need to access my directories, it's all there. Um, I can access my image output folder relatively easily, and I can keep an eye on exactly what's going on in the command prompt as things are generating and as Easy Diffusion is working through and doing stuff. Just best practice to be able to kind of see what's happening and the more you look at this the more comfortable you will get with working with the command window as well as just understanding what's going on in general with stable diffusion so when we first launch easy diffusion we are brought directly into the generate tab and this is where we are going to be spending 99 percent of our time in this program this is where you're going to generate all of your stable diffusion images and where you're going to be working you also have a settings tab here at the top. We will come back into this tab and we will go through the settings and talk about what some of these mean. Help and community. This is where you can find some guides that Easy Diffusion has put up if you would like some more detailed help beyond what we're going to go over in our videos. You can also access their Discord community and their Reddit community through this tab. Then there is a what's new tab which is where they list all of the major changes and updates as they update the version of Easy Diffusion. So you can see for version 3.0, which is what we're working in, these are all of the major changes, and then they have a detailed change log, and prior to that, they did the same thing for version 2.5. It's good to stay up to date with this because as things get updated, you will have new and improved tools and functions available to you. Then last but not least, we have a model tools tab. This is where we can set up some parameters for various LoRa's that we will use. And we're gonna come back to this and talk about how to use it, how to get it best set up so it can make your life easier. You're going to wanna stay on top of this as you download more and more LoRa's and your collection grows. Take it from personal experience, if you just download a mass amount of LoRa's and your library is massive and you don't kind of keep them organized and update things as you go, it gets very tedious and out of hand to go back and do very quickly. But for now, we're going to jump back to the Generate tab and talk about the UI here because this is where we're going to be making all of our Stable Diffusion art. So upon entering Easy Diffusion, your homepage is going to be the Generate tab. And this is where, like I said, you're gonna be spending 99% of your time while you're using the program. 
the first thing we immediately see is the prompt box. And that's where you see it says enter the prompt. There's a little question mark next to it. If you hover over the question mark anywhere in Easy Diffusion, it will give you an explanation of that particular section. Now the default prompt you're going to see in Easy Diffusion is a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse. Since we're here, let's just go ahead and already generate our first AI image. And we do that by simply clicking make image. When we click that, Easy Diffusion is gonna do its thing. We can see the command prompt working and we have our first image a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse. Now, if we look back at the prompt box, we can enter the prompt. We have an option to load our prompt from a text file. We have image modifiers, where if we click this button, it will bring up a menu of all kinds of different modifiers we can add to our image, like 2D, 8-bit, 16-bit, CGI, cartoon, comic book. This is a really great function to use if you are brand new to AI art and maybe you don't quite know the depths of how deep you can go with prompting. Go crazy and add all kinds of image modifiers and make all kinds of wacky combinations and see what you can come up with. That's part of the fun of all this. That's the image modifier button. We have the add embedding button, which allows us to add embeddings and textural inversions like we talked about in our recent file management video. You see we have our easy negative embedding that we installed in that video available to us right here. Underneath our prompt box, we have our negative prompt. Now, if we were to twirl this down, we're going to get another prompt box and any text that you put in here is going to be stuff that Stable Diffusion is actually going to try to keep out of the image that gets generated from your positive prompt. This is optional. However, it is a best practice to always have a negative prompt and to slowly add in words or items that you don't want to see in the image and not just hit it with a paragraph right off the jump. Now, we also have a negative embedding button for the negative prompt box, and that would actually be where your easy negative embedding goes because it is a negative embedding. There are positive embeddings, which could be things like character embeddings that would put a character like The Rock or an anime character in your prompt. Now, we're going to collapse the negative prompt box for the time being. Right underneath that, we have the initial image or the image to image. And again, this is optional and you have two options here. You can either browse and add an image from somewhere on your computer to allow Easy Diffusion to use that as the reference image to build your generation off of, or we can draw something. And when we click draw something, they'll bring up this little sketch pad and we can sketch anything and it'll use that sketch as your initial image for Stable Diffusion to reference. Underneath that, of course, we have the make image button and we have our image settings. All right, so if we twirl down the image settings tab, this is where we're going to get all of the parameters that will allow us to dive in really deep and customize our settings for the image that we're going to be generating. So our first parameter that we have is the seed. The seed refers to the randomization of the image. Now, if we have the seed set to random, then every time we generate the image, it's going to be completely different. So right now we have random turned off, right? So let's go ahead and just generate an image, a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse. And we have random turned off. So the seed is, is, is exactly the same. Let's go ahead and make the image again. We got the exact same image. Now, if we turn random on, and make the image, well, we're going to get something completely different, right? But let's say we really like this image and we want to try to customize a prompt a little, well, we would turn random off and we would just work within that seed. So keep random turned on. If you're hunting for a good image with your prompt and you're making changes and you're generating, 
turn random on once you find an image you like that you would like to start to refine more and use as your starting point. Then we have number of images. That's how many images it will generate at a single time. So let's go ahead and just turn this to two and two in parallel and notice the button change to make two images. So when we go ahead and generate that, well, now it's going to give us two images in parallel. And it's going to give us two different images, but based on the same seed. And we can click on which one we would like to use as the input if we want to. Now, right beneath that, we have the model drop down. And this is where we can choose which model we would like to use based on the models that we downloaded in our previous video for file management. So you can see we have Dream Shaper 8, Dream Shaper XL, Photon, Rev Animated, the base model, Stable Diffusion 1.5, and the SDXL Niji Special. We were generating this image with Photon. Let's see the difference if we generate it with Rev Animated. See, so a little bit more cartoonish, a little bit more kind of drawn, a little less of like a realistic photograph. So different models, different styles. Now underneath that, we have clip skip. This is a bit more of an advanced setting. So we will come back and we will talk about that once we dive into really refining our imagery in the next video. We have the control net image, which is the image that we would like to use as the control net or the base layer for the image that we want to generate. So if we want to generate an image based off of Mona Lisa, we would load the image of Mona Lisa here. And once we load an image in there, it's going to ask us for what filter to apply. And the filter has all the different names of the control nets. And then it's going to select the corresponding control net model. So if I was to pick canny, it'll change the model to canny. So you just have to pick what filter. And the first time you run an image with a control net on it in Easy Diffusion, it's actually going to download all of those control nets for you automatically. So you actually don't have to go and download all the control nets from Civitai. But we're going to close this just to make it easier to look at for now. Underneath that, we have the custom vey. We discussed vey's in the previous video. If we pull down the drop down menu, we will see the vey 840,000 EMA pruned, which is the vey that we downloaded in the previous video as well. So we could select that and let, let's see how the vey affects the image that we generate. And we're actually going to change this back to one and one just to make testing these things out a little quicker as we go through this video, but we'll let this do its thing right now. Notice when we put the vey on, things take just a little bit longer, but okay, that is a more detailed image. I don't know why this guy switched to that type of resolution, but let's try that one more time. I'm going to clear all these. Actually, I'm just going to clear this guy because we don't like that. That's not a good comparison. Boom. Oh, okay. It's so it switched the resolution because of that, that control net image I temporarily loaded. So you see the V didn't make too much of a difference, but if you were to compare these two closely, you'll see some small variations in like the hooves and the coloring and just little things. Um, we have the sampler now. We're not going to go through and explain what each one of these do. You can read Easy Diffusion's um, definition of the samplers in their menu right here. However, just know that it is worth testing multiple samplers on your imagery because different samplers provide much different visual results. Just as an example, we will try this with the DPM22, DPM++2M M. Karis, we were on Euler Ancestral, which is kind of the universal one, but let's just see the, the difference in, in imagery when we get the photo with this sampler. 
okay, see, so it actually cleaned it up a lot, gave us a different horse, a different astronaut, and we can just see like a lot more detail with this sampler, even though it took an extra second or two to generate the image. Then we have the image size where you can set your image resolution. Now, most stable diffusion models are trained on imagery of 512 by 512. So you will get the best generations from that resolution. However, you can go ahead and set the width and the height to whatever you would like right here. And it has the little asterisks next to the sizes that are the best for image generations. Then we have the inference steps. The steps are how many times Easy Diffusion is going to run through the entire process of iterating over your image until it gets to the final result. More steps does not necessarily mean better, but we ran this at 25 steps. Let's just try to run it at 30 real quick so we can see the difference. So we're doing five more steps than we previously did. Now, if we look, we can see slight differences. See, it actually gave him a third hoof. We don't really want that. Let's try dropping it by five and only going to 20 steps as opposed to 25. Okay, this one actually looks a little cleaner. We got a little bit more detail in the horse's elbow. Um, just a little bit more detail on the horse in general. The astronaut leaves a little bit to be desired. So I think 25 is pretty much the happy medium for this general image right now. The guidance scale is also what we would refer to as the CFG. Now, this is the amount that Stable Diffusion will try to adhere to your prompt. More does not necessarily mean better. There is definitely a cap and somewhere between like seven to 15 is extremely high, but let's just say we up this to 10. Let's see what this looks like at 10 compared to 7.5. So it's going to try to adhere to the prompt a little bit more closely. And again, we see the astronaut gets a little bit more detail. Same thing with the horse, but we also get like this weird third arm on the astronaut right here. So we'll turn that back to 7.5. However, this is the strength that it will adhere to your prompt. And all of these settings will make more sense once we dive in and really start to refine and prompt for our own photo and learn how to do that. Nothing is going to look very impressive with a prompt like this with just the base settings. Beneath guidance scale, we have the Laura drop down. Now, this is the menu where you will be able to select whatever Laura you would like to use that you downloaded from Civitai and put into your Laura folder. So let's say we wanted to use the Psy AI Laura. Well, we would have to put in the trigger word for that, which is Psy AI. And it's on a strength of 0.5. Let's go ahead and make the image. And this should make our astronaut on the horse just a little bit more trippy. Okay, see, we got this really cool kind of like purple and blue background. The horse has like a blue mane. I think in general, this looks a little bit prettier. Now let's see what happens if we turn this all the way up to a strength of one. And this should be a very trippy ash. Okay, okay, see, very trippy astronaut horse. So. 0.5 was cool. We'll go ahead and take that off for now. So seamless tiling is another more advanced setting that we will dive into once we really start refining the prompt. Then we have the output format, which is JPEG, PNG, or WebP. The JPEG or PNG are mainly going to be your go-tos. And we have image quality. Sometimes you don't want to crank this up too high. 75 is a really safe zone and enable ve tiling. This optimizes your memory for larger images. It is real easy for Stable Diffusion to hog all the memory on your GPU. This will help you optimize it. Then render settings, show a live preview. This uses more VRAM and results in slower images. We're gonna keep that turned off. 
fix incorrect eyes and faces. We could turn that on, but we would only use that if we were trying to actually prompt for a character or do something more like a portrait generation. Then we can do an upscale if we want by turning this on where it's going to take this 512 by 512 image and we can actually choose the amount we would like it to upscale. Do we want it to make it double the resolution or four times the resolution? And we can turn on show only the corrected or upscaled image. So it'll only show you the final final. If you turn that off, it will show you the low resolution image as well as the upscaled image. So that is a lot. As a beginner, the main settings that you should be messing with so it doesn't get too overwhelming is your seed, what model you're using, what sampler you're using, your steps, and your guidance scale or your CFG, as well as any LoRa's. Everything else you can kind of put on the back burner for the time being. And let's take a look at the settings menu. We're going to come back here in the next video and really start to dive into prompt crafting as well as tweaking the image settings so that you can get the very best generations out of your prompts as quickly as possible. But for now, let's take a look at the settings menu. All right, so now we are in the system settings or the settings tab of Easy Diffusion. And we're going to talk about some of the core things you wanna be aware of in here that you wanna get set up in a way that suits your operating system. And that'll just make it easier for you to keep track of your images as you really start to generate. But first things first, at the very top, we have the theme. If you like the default, by all means, I personally really like the super dark mode of Easy Diffusion, so I'm going to be rocking with that. Um, right now, we have Auto Save Images turned off. If you turn this on, then every single image you generate will be saved to whatever directory you put in this box. So if you would like your images saved to a specific place, you can go ahead and change that there. And it will ask you what format you would like the metadata. If you want your images to not have any metadata, which means that your prompt and all your image settings follow your image, say you post it on Civitai, if you have the metadata embedded, then when you upload your image to Civitai, Civitai is going to read that embedded metadata and tell everyone what your prompt was, how many steps you ran, what your CFG scale was, and if you used any LoRa's and what model you used. So best practice is to change this to embedded. You can choose to save it as a separate text file. You can do both the embed and a separate text file. For the time being, I'm gonna leave this at none and I'm gonna turn off auto save images because I don't want every single image we generate to be auto saved to my computer. We have the models folder. So this is the path to the folder where all your models are kept. As you can see, this is my location where I downloaded and installed the models to. You have a safe filter here to block NSFW images. So if an image is detected to be NSFW or to be, you know, 18 or, or over material, it will blur it out and block it. You have the enable sound, um, process newest jobs first. This reverses the normal processing order. We're gonna leave that turned off. Extract LoRa tags from the prompt. So this will automatically extract LoRa tags from the prompt and apply the correct LoRa name if present. So all this really means is that it's gonna simplify the LoRa setting. If you copy a prompt from Civitai and it has this LoRa tag in it, which is the syntax that you will have to use to use LoRa's in Automatic 11.11 and other stable diffusion based programs, it will just read this and simplify it down to just the word. So like for Psy AI, it would be bracket, Laura, semicolon, Psy AI, semicolon, and then the strength, which right now is 0 0.4, and then bracket. 
Well, if we have this turned on, when we enter that, it'll just say Psy AI. And that's really all we have to put to get it to activate in Easy Diffusion because it is easy. Open browser on startup, I like that. So anytime we start up our command prompt using the start stable diffusion UI.cmd, it will automatically open your browser and put you at the home page, which is the generate tab of Easy Diffusion. GPU memory usage, we're going to keep this on balance. However, you can change it to really fast and use more of your GPU, or you can change it to low if you have a GPU with only three to four gigabytes of memory. If you do not have a GPU, you can turn on the option to use your CPU, but just know that your image generations will go are going to be very, very slow. All stable diffusion programs operate off of a GPU and VRAM. Um, we have auto save settings turned on and you can configure this even further. We have confirmed dangerous actions turned on and this will make you have to confirm any actions that might lead to data lost. You have your profile name. We're just going to keep this to default for now. If you want to give yourself a profile name, you can go ahead and do that. And you can turn on the beta channel if you like and get the latest features immediately, but it could be less stable. Please restart the program after changing this. So that's only if you want to be like, I want the new, new stuff in Easy Diffusion right now. I'm going to go ahead and keep that turned off and use the new V3 engine. We're going to keep that turned on. This gives you the ability to use stuff like Laura's control nets, SDXL, embeddings, tiling, and lots more. Please press save and restart the program. So that's turned on by default. We're just going to use that because we're in the newest version of Easy Diffusion. And we don't really need to address any of the network stuff on the bottom here. And at the very bottom, you can see that the system info is Easy Diffusion reading your computer specs and what it is actually working with based on what is inside of your computer. Now, I know that was a lot to take in. This has been the overview of just the Easy Diffusion UI. We are going to dig into generating really great images and crafting those in the next video and really diving into these settings much, much more. However, now we are going to jump over to Automatic 1111 and get familiar with the user interface in that program. So if you only downloaded Easy Diffusion, that is it for this video. If you downloaded both or you are waiting for Automatic 1111, then we will see you in the next part. All right, well, now that we have went over our user interface for Easy Diffusion, let's go ahead and go over the user interface for Automatic 1111. So we are going to find the directory where we installed Automatic 1111. Mine is in my Auto 1111 folder in my D drive and then it is inside the Stable Diffusion Web UI folder. And we're going to find the run.bat file. So we're going to double click run.bat. It's going to open up the command prompt, the same as Easy Diffusion. This is going to call up all the commands and it's going to start up the automatic 1111 Web UI, which will automatically open up your browser. Now, please keep in mind that mine will look just a little different than yours. There will be a few more tabs and a few more options. That's because I have a few extensions installed, but don't worry. I'm going to call out the sections that are relevant to you, and we're only going to focus on what you need to know. So don't worry about that. And let's dive into automatic 1111. So before we really start talking about anything, let's take a moment to look at how the user interface for Automatic 1111 is laid out. So at the very top, no matter what page you're on, you're going to have your checkpoint selection box at the very top on the left. This is where you can select the things like Dream Shaper, Rev Animated, Photon, the Sable Diffusion 1.5 base model. This is where all of your models or checkpoints are going to be located after you put them in your model folder. Next to that, we have 
the Stable Diffusion Vey, which you'll see the only Vey that I have in here is the Vey 840,000, the same one we downloaded from our file management video. These two boxes will be at the top no matter which tab you go to and work in in Automatic 1111. If you have Automatic 1111 open and you're actively downloading and dropping new models into your model folder, you don't have to restart the entire program. All you have to do is click the little refresh button right here and it will refresh the list and pull the folder over again and you should see any new stuff you dropped into the folder in that list as long as you go ahead and click that refresh button. Now, right beneath that, we have the individual tabs and these are for all of the different sections in Automatic 1111 that you can work in. Now, the one that we are mainly going to focus on here is text to image, which is the main tab that you are introduced to when you first open Automatic 1111. And this is always going to be your default homepage, if you will. Next to that, we have image to image, which is where we can use control nets to generate an image from a reference photo. You have your extras tab. We're not going to go too deep into this one. We have the PNG info. This actually allows you to drop a PNG of another stable diffusion generated image in this box, and then it'll tell you all the generation info. So I'll come back and we will show you this. We have the checkpoint merger. We're not gonna cover this, but this is where you can merge and combine multiple checkpoints. You have the train tab, which is where you can train your own models and embeddings. Um, we're not going to touch this. We have the settings. This is where you will find all of your different various tweakable settings and general settings for Stable Diffusion. For the most part, we are going to leave this. For the most part, we are going to leave this at its default. And probably one of the most important tabs we have are the extensions tab. Now, when we first come in here, we're going to see a list of things that are installed. You might not really see anything. You might just see a couple things in here. Um, there is something very important that we have to install that I'm going to show you how to install right now. And that is the control net extension because we want the control nets to be enabled from the very beginning. So before we do anything else, we are going to come to our extensions tab Right now, you can see we're in the tab for the list of extensions that are installed. We are going to go to the available tab and you're going to click this button right here that says load from. When you click load from, it's going to load up an entire list of all the different extensions that are available for automatic 1111. And this list can look very overwhelming if you do not know what you're looking for. But no worries, we're going to go ahead and type in control net in the search box. And everything with the word control net will come up in the list. What you are going to install is this one right here. The SD-WebUI-ControlNet Manipulations, comma, or sorry, it says installed because I have it installed already. But you're going to look for that one, the SD-WebUI-ControlNet Manipulations. You're going to go ahead and just click the install button on that one. And after that installs, this will probably tell you or ask you if you would like to restart your web UI. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and close this down after it is finished installing. And you are going to just reopen it with your run.bat file. And when it reopens, what you should see on your homepage is now this little section right here that says control net with a version number. And if you twirl it down, you'll see you have all the little control net options. What this does is this will actually give you the control net 
folder in your model folder where you need to put your control net models. This is something that I have to go back that I should have called out in our installation video and in our file management video when I was talking about control nets. I will go back and make a notation on that video. However, we need this extension installed so we have the control net folder here to put the control net models into. Now the other tabs in your text to image section right here, we have textual inversion. This is where all of your embeddings or textual inversions are going to be kept. If you have a Excel model selected, it will only show you embeddings or textual inversions that can be used with Stable Diffusion Excel. If you go ahead and select a non Excel model, so Dream Shaper 8, then it should show us the textual inversions and embeddings that we have that we can use with Stable Diffusion 1.5. Hyper networks, we're not really going to, to use much of, so we're gonna skip that one. Checkpoints, this is where you can see a visual representation of all your models. If you upload a photo for them, and we will show you how to do that in a later video as well, but this is just where you will see cards for all of your models. It's generally easier just to select the model you want to use from the drop down menu. And you also have the same thing for your LoRa's. So I have my LoRa library that I actually set up with PNGs um, images to show me a quick visual representation of what the LoRa does. And I chose a Buddha theme. So I generated an image of a whole different bunch of types of Buddhas. And this shows me exactly what each one of my Laura's kind of does stylistically. We'll get into that later, but just know that this is where you can find your Laura's. And we'll talk about how to set up your keywords and all that kind of stuff as we get deeper into all this. But this is where all of your Laura's in your Laura folder will be kept. However, we're going to learn the best way to use the syntax to call the Laura's in the next video. All right, so here we are at the home page of Automatic 1111 in our text to image tab. Now let's go over what we see here from the top to the bottom. At the top, as we called out previously, we have our model selector. We're going to go ahead and leave it on Dream Shaper XL. We have our Stable Diffusion V. We're just going to go ahead and leave that on Automatic. And the first box that we are met with is our prompt box. You see, it says prompt right there. This is where we punch in exactly what we want to see in our image. So we're just going to go ahead and type in image of a hat. And we're going to go ahead and hit generate and generate our first image in automatic 1111. This probably won't be anything too incredible, but there we go. We have an image of a cat. Right underneath that, we have our negative prompt. This is where we would type in anything that we don't want to see. So if we typed in cartoon and we hit generate, hopefully this should give us something back that is a cat that is not a cartoon. And there we go. We have a very realistic image looking. And there we go. We have a very realistic looking image of a cat. Now underneath the negative prompt box, we have our generation tab. This is where your main settings and parameters you're going to use to generate your images are located. Now for any of these parameters, if you hover over the name, you'll actually get a little pop-up that tells you what that parameter is for. It gives you a little base description. So for sampling method, it says which algorithm to use to produce the image. We discuss this in the easy diffusion section. The sampler you use will produce drastically different results in your output image and everyone tends to have their favorite. There's no wrong answer, but there are visual differences. This happens to be my favorite sampler, so I'm going to leave it on that. We have our sampling steps, which is how many times stable diffusion will improve the generated image iteratively over and over. So right now it's set to 20 which means that Stable Diffusion runs the diffusion process 20 times over before it gives you the final image. More steps does not necessarily mean better, but 
it can drastically change the image. We'll take a look at that in a second. Beneath our sampling steps, we have the high res fix option. If we open this, well, this enables high res fix, which is the native upscaler for automatic 1111. If we have this box twirled down and open like this, it will be upscaling our image to the resolution that it says right here. So right now, you can see that we are generating a 512 by 512 square image. This is going to upscale it because it's upscaling it by a factor of two to 1024 by 1024. So it's doubling the resolution of the image. These are the parameters for the upscale. We will go ahead and dive further into that once we really get into crafting better images in the next video. Just know that if this is open, you have the upscale enabled. If it is closed, then your image will not be upscaled. Best practice is to iterate your images in low resolution first and only open that when you're ready to upscale because the upscale does take a little bit more time and resources to spit out the image. Next to that, we have the refiner and the refiner is for Stable Diffusion XL and it uses a second checkpoint and there is a specific refiner checkpoint for Stable Diffusion XL that can drastically improve the quality of your image, something we will come back to in the next video once we start crafting better images. Beneath that, and very important, is our width and height slider. So these are not linked. You will have to manually set these numbers or you can slide it up and down. We are going to leave it at 512 by 512 for this video just because it's simple and that resolution generally generates very quickly. But this is where you change your image resolution. And once you start generating images, there are gonna be certain resolutions that you stick to. You'll have like a one by one, which is a square, a four by five, which is a rectangle, which is for Facebook and for Im um, Instagram image posts and a 9x16, which is for a full vertical phone screen image. And we will go over those more as well once we get into crafting the images. We have our batch count, which if we read what it says right there, how many batches of images to create. This has no impact on generation performance or VRAM usage. So this basically will just increase the amount of images per generation and batch size is how many images to create in a single batch. So if we only want one batch, but we want a batch size of four, well, it's going to create four images in one batch. But if we want two batches with a batch size of four, then it's going to create two batches of four images, so eight altogether. Then we have our CFG scale. The CFG scale is how tightly you would like Stable Diffusion to listen to your prompt. There is definitely a balancing act here. A seven is kind of like normal average. 15 is very high. So look, if we take seven and I'm just gonna reuse our seed here real quick so I can get the same image. If we take the seven and we scale it up to 10 and we rerun the image of the cat, well, this cat definitely got a little bit more detailed. Let's run this cat all the way up to 15 now. And yeah, that completely broke the image. Let's scale him back down to seven. And there's our pretty image of our cat again. So. CFG is definitely something you're going to want to play with. The higher you have it, the, the tighter it will try to adhere to your prompt, but there is definitely an upper limit before your image starts to break. And the lower you have it, the more creative you allow it to be. So let's just say we take it all the way down to something like three, which is literally half of where we had it. Okay, still a cat, but not quite as detailed, but we really like the seven one. 
So this is a parameter you're going to have to play with as you're generating your images and figure out what works best for your project. Now, underneath that, you have your seed. By default, this is going to be set to negative one, which means you're going to be generating with a random seed. Now, the seed, the definition automatic gives us is a value that determines the output of random number generators. If you create an image with same parameters and seed as another image, you'll get the same result. So the seed is very useful if we want consistency and if we want to iterate on an image. So see, here's our seed for the image we have right now. Let's go ahead and copy that, but let's randomize it real quick and hit generate. We're going to get a completely different cat, like completely different. This is barely even a cat. Let's generate that one more time. Okay. So now we got a cat again, but it's a completely different cat, right? If we paste in the seed that we had in there before, we are going to get the same cat. So you can start to see how the seed would be very useful when we get a base image that we like, but we would like to iterate on it and start to craft the prompt more and really build off of that main base image that we liked. So a couple last things to note on our text to image tab. Down here, we have our control net extension window that we can uncollapse. And this is where your control net extension will live. It's very important to know where this is. We're going to dive into this deeper in a future video when we get to really crafting images better. And then we'll get into the parameters and all that good stuff with the control nets. Right here is your window where you will get your image preview of the images you generate. There will be a bunch of options right underneath it for saving your images or sending your images to um, other tabs in Automatic 1111. For example, the button that we're going to use immediately is going to be the send image and generation parameters to image to image tab. Underneath the buttons and little options you have right here. And as we called out before, if you hover over them, it will give you the um, it will give you the definition of the button. <clears throat> and as we called out before, it will give you the description of the button as you hover over it. Underneath that, you have all of the parameters, AKA the metadata for the image that you generated. So if we were to upload this image to civitai.com to our profile, this is all of the information that will be uploaded to the website with this image. And then up here underneath our generate button, we have the waste basket. And this is where we can trash all of our settings and just start over. But we're going to jump into our image to image tab. So the first thing we're going to do is take our photo of our cat with us. And we're going to use this button right here of the little photo that says send image and generation parameters to image to image tab. So we're going to go ahead and click that. And that will bring us to the image to image tab and it will load up our cat with the image parameters that are all exactly the same from our text to image tab. Now the image to image tab is not something we're going to get really deep into right now because there is a lot we could talk about here. However, this is going to be the place where we can further refine the images that we generate in our text to image tab. So let's just look at an example. Underneath image to image, we have our prompt box, which you see our prompt carried over from text to image. We have our negative prompt box, which again carried over from text to image. Our same model is loaded. And there are a couple different places that we could work in, in image to image. We're going to just stay in base image to image right now and talk about the others later. So here's our image of our cat. We have all the same parameters down here, except we also have a couple upscale parameters. We're just going to leave it at just resize for right now, but we can see if we hover over it, this says that it res oh, it says that this resizes image to target resolution. Unless height and width match, you will get incorrect aspect ratios. So our height and width match. However, 
to change this a little we're going to actually make the resolution bigger but we're still going to keep it a one by one square so we're going to do 720 by 720 we're going to up our sampling steps just a little and we are going to type in image of a dragon and we're going to hit generate you will see what it generates is an image of kind of like a dragon but it's using the reference of our image of our cat so we're getting this kind of like cool dragon cat thing and that's why it's called image to image because we are working off of this base image now you do have an extra setting in your parameters down here which is your denoising strength and it says this determines how little respect the algorithm should have for the image's content at zero nothing will change and at one you'll get an unrelated image with values below one processing will take less steps than the sampling step slider specifies we ran this at 0.55 and we can clearly see the influence of our cat in the image let's bump this up to 0.6 and see what starts to happen all right now we're getting now we're definitely getting a dragon and it is still pulling the composition of the cat if we were to bump that up to 0.65 we should get full dragon and it'll probably still be in the general composition of the cat which you can see is what's happening we now just have a dragon but it's pulling from the cat so the image to image tab is where we will work with already existing images and use them as references and places to start to build off of and refine we will jump into things like in painting later when we start refining our images <clears throat> we will jump into things like in painting later when we start to refine our images even further we have our extras tab which is where we can do We have our extras tab, which for the time being, we're not going to talk about. Again, this is for a much later, much more advanced video. We have our PNG info tab. Now, this one right here is really useful because we can pull in any PNG of any generated image and it will give us all of the parameters, including the prompt and the negative prompt of that image. And then we can just send that directly to one of the sections like image to image so okay here's this image of this cat and if we put image of a dragon i'm gonna change these settings so they just match what i was using before real quick and we're going to generate that and now we should get a dragon cat that is similar to this one so you can see how the png info tab would be extremely useful for our settings for the time being we are going to go ahead and leave these all the same we might come in here and tweak a few things as we start learning how to refine our images but for all beginner purposes the default settings should be more than okay for you and we already talked about our extensions tab so the best part so the best way to learn programs like this is to experiment and to have fun before we dive in to generating really cool images what i think would be a really great exercise for you to do in between this this video and the next one is go to civitai.com and find an image that you really like like let's take this one for example right here and check this out we have the full prompt for this image and we can go ahead and we can copy it we can go back to stable diffusion we can paste the prompt in there do they have a negative prompt they didn't use a negative prompt we do have the seed though so we can use the same seed and 
this looks like it was a 4x5 image. So let's say 1080 by 1350. They use a CFG of 4.5 and 39 steps. So let's try CFG at 4.5 and 39 steps. Now we are using a different model than them. So we're going to get a different result no matter what. And they used the Huen, 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 Huen sampler. So let's go ahead and use that and go ahead and click generate. This is a really great way to start to see how things affect your image generation differently. And this is really the best way to learn is by taking inspiration from others. And there's a lot to pull inspiration from on civitai.com. But between this video and the next one to get familiar, look up some photos that you really like, check out the prompts and then start altering and tweaking the prompts. Now look, this is what we got from just taking the inspiration from that image, even though we're using a different model. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty good start to generating our own things. So, so get on civitai.com, explore the website, experiment, and we will catch you guys in the next one. Congratulations on making it this far. We really hope that you are just a little bit more comfortable navigating the user interfaces of either Easy Diffusion or Automatic 1111. And please remember that the best way to rapidly get better at generating AI images and at using these kind of programs is to continuously experiment and play and just have fun with it. We'll catch you guys in the next one, civitai.com.